that this legislation has nothing to do with ending our dependence on foreign oil. Um, it does have something to do with ending our dependence on oil. In fact, what this legislation would do is make it much more difficult for Americans to enjoy the standard of living we do by making it much more costly to indulge in any consumption of energy in any form, including driving vehicles, including turning on the lights or the air conditioning in a building. All of these things are deliberately made much more expensive in this legislation, deliberately because the point of it is to make energy consumption so expensive that we won't consume as much of it, and that way um, uh, the earth will somehow um, not be warmed as much uh, because we won't be consuming as much energy. That's the whole point here. So it's not about ending our, de our dependence on foreign oil. This legislation has nothing to do with that at all. Madam President, people might ask, what is cap and trade? Why are we talking about cap and trade legislation? Well, the cap and trade contemplated in this bill has the federal government creating something of value, carbon emission allowances. And they're equal to the cap on emissions that are set by the federal government each year. So the federal government says, Americans, you can only drive so much, or you can only uh, consume so much electricity. And the people who produce that product are going to have to pay for the right to produce the energy that you're consuming. And then, of course, they're going to pass that cost on to you. Some of these allocations are uh, allocated to favored groups. Others are auctioned off. But the cost of the allowances is passed on to the consumers, as I said. And these outstanding allowances can be traded. That's why it's called cap and trade. So you have a group of speculators then who are able to buy up some of the allowances and sell them at a profit, even though they, they produce nothing of value in the meantime. Um, but while it's referred to as cap and trade, we should appreciate the fact that in reality, it is very clearly nothing more than another tax on American consumers. And a very good article in the Washington Post by Robert Samuelson uh, points this out. He says, and I quote, the chief political virtue of cap and trade is its complexity. This allows its environmental supporters to shape public perceptions in essentially deceptive ways. Cap and trade would act as a tax, but it's not described as a tax. It would regulate economic activity, but it's promoted as a free market mechanism. Finally, it would trigger a tidal wave of influence peddling as lobbyists scrambled to exploit the system for different industries and localities." End of quote. And the Congressional Budget Office itself, a bipartisan group of uh, nonpartisan group representing the Congress, acknowledges that businesses would pass on most of the costs imposed by a cap and trade system to American consumers. This would amount to a regressive stealth tax that would hit low and middle income families the hardest. Now, what does the uh, proposal here cost? According to the Congressional Budget Office, the Boxer Substitute Amendment before us would take out of the private sector $902 billion between 2009 and 2018. Of that amount, the Boxer Substitute manages to spend all but $66 billion. $836 billion of allowances are distributed, not only to favored technologies and utilities, but also to buy off interests that would use funds in ways that do not decrease carbon, such as for farming practices, endangered species, Indian tribes, state governments, and to other countries for their forests. CBO considers the distribution of these free allowances to be the same as distributing cash, and indeed, that's exactly what it is. Over the longer term, the Environmental Protection Agency projects that the amendment would redistribute 6.2 trillion, that's with a T, 6.2 trillion dollars from the private sector to the federal government by the year 2050 through these allowance auctions that energy producers and manufacturers would be required to purchase in order to be able to continue their operations, meaning continue to provide energy for us. Another $3.2 trillion would be auctioned off by states and others. According to the administration, the nearly $10 trillion cost would make this bill the single most expensive regulation in the history of the United States of America. 
If a cap-and-trade system like the one in the Boxer Substitute is implemented, a number of economists believe it would add significant costs to the production side of the economy and would likely have a severe negative impact on long-term U.S. economic growth, despite having a very modest impact on worldwide carbon levels. The cap-and-trade system is designed, or excuse me, is intended by designed to raise the cost of gas and electricity, as I said in the very beginning. Raising the cost of gas and electricity will change people's behavior. They'll use less energy, and as a result, theoretically, emit less carbon. The cap-and-trade program cannot achieve its goals unless it increases the cost of energy, and the proponents don't deny this. So when you're thinking about the high cost of gasoline today, think about the additional cost that's going to be imposed by this legislation. The proponents say, well, it's going up anyway. Well, you don't have to make it go up more than it would otherwise, and that's what this legislation would do. The American Council for Capital Formation projects that under this cap-and-trade system, gasoline prices would rise from about $4 a gallon today to $5.33 a gallon by 2014, and $9.01 a gallon by the year 2030. As I noted, businesses would have to pass on most of the costs imposed by a cap-and-trade system to their consumers. One must recognize that the demand for energy is relatively inelastic. In other words, even as prices rise, individuals find it difficult to switch to alternatives. It's very hard to engage in any activity that does not use energy. As a result, individuals would be forced to bear the cost increases imposed by the system. They might use less energy, drive less, live in colder homes during the winter, or turn off air conditioners in the summer. Those are the choices. When individuals use less energy, they buy less, they travel less, and in effect curtail overall economic activity. The gross domestic product of this country would be roughly 1% lower at the end of 2014 and 2.6% lower by 2030 under this legislation. That's a huge, huge reduction in the economy of the United States and therefore the well-being of the American people. And as economic activity slows, employers aren't going to hire as many workers. In fact, employers would create 850,000 fewer jobs by 2014 and 3 million fewer jobs by 2030. My home state of Arizona would lose 63,500 uh, jobs by 2030, roughly speaking. And ironically, this bill would become an economic stimulus for China and India, as they would meet the manufacturing demands that we could no longer produce competitively. Perhaps more striking is the cost on American households, American incomes. Cap-and-trade legislation would, on average, reduce income adjusted for inflation by $1,000 in 2014 and $4,000 by 2030. My home state residents in Arizona would see their income fall by $3,400 by 2030. However, not everyone will bear the same burden. Cap and, trade is cap and trade is incredibly regressive in its impact, since low-income households spend a higher fraction of their income on energy. According to the Congressional Budget Office, just a 15 percent cut in carbon emissions would cost low-income households almost twice as much as, as high-income households. Cap-and-trade reduces the after-tax income of those in the bottom fifth of the income distribution by 3.3 percent. The top 20 percent of the income distribution would see their disposable income fall by 1.7 percent. It's important to note that Senator Boxer's amendment claims that it would reduce carbon emissions by 66 percent by 2050, or more than four times the amount CBO simulated. Of course, uh, we uh, obviously uh, uh, I believe that CBO is, is far more correct in its assessment here. But, assuming that the Senator were correct, then one might expect the amendment to reduce individuals' incomes four times as much as CBO estimated as well. Think about that, you know, twelve to $15,000 reductions in income. I mentioned before that this creates winners and losers, and part of this is based on the whims of Congress. We would have the authority to make the distinctions that would enable some people to, to be better off than others. The uh, amendment before us would redistribute $836 billion of allowances over the 2009 and 2018 period to various special interest groups. Just imagine that, Congress being in charge 
of redistributing $836 billion. And we're going to do that without any influence of special interests? I think not. Robert Samuelson noted in the article that I quoted from earlier, and I'm quoting, beneficiaries of the free allowances would include farmers, Indian tribes, new technology companies, utilities, and states. Call this environmental pork, and that would be just a start. The program's potential to confer subsidies and preferential treatment would stimulate a lobbying frenzy. Think of today's farm programs and multiply by 10. The tax and spend system, in other words, would create arbitrary winners and losers. Over the life of the bill, it would give away allowances valued at approximately $3.2 trillion for auction by states and other entities. And let me conclude with this point, Madam President. While having all of this dramatic negative impact, the benefits are questionable at best. They don't meet any rational cost-benefit analysis. A recent editorial in the Wall Street Journal aptly summed up the cap and trade as follows. Trillions in assets and millions of jobs would be at the mercy of Congress and the bureaucracy, all for greenhouse gas reductions that would have a meaningless impact on global carbon emissions if China and India don't participate, and only somewhat less meaningless if they do." End of quote. So it's doubtful that a cap-and-trade system would actually accomplish the goal of reducing emissions and decreasing global temperatures. A report released by the Environmental Protection Agency indicates that even with a cap-and-trade system in place in the U.S., there would still be a net increase in carbon emissions over the next several decades. Indeed, other cap-and-trade efforts have been unsuccessful. For example, the Kyoto Protocol, an international cap-and-trade system aimed at controlling and reducing greenhouse gases, has largely been considered a failure. The European trading system has not only failed to reduce emissions as contemplated, it has constrained growth in developed countries and has enhanced unrestricted development in countries such as China and India. So before we sacrifice the U.S. economy and American jobs, we need to quantify the benefits of having a relatively slight reduction in greenhouse gases and compare it to the huge costs imposed on the U.S. economy and American families. In sum, the amendment before us would increase energy prices, harm American families, and likely have a negative impact on long-term U.S. growth. Moreover, it's questionable whether the legislation would even make a perceptible dent in carbon emissions and decreasing global temperatures.